Hello and welcome to Beyond Markets, where we bring you up to speed on development outcomes in Africa. I'm Kenneth Iboma, and thank you so much for joining me on today's show. Today, we'll look at Africa's growth trajectory, starting with a walk down memory lane to the last decade. We'll also look ahead and explore what the continent needs to put in place to achieve its future development targets. And definitely, you can join the conversation on social, social media. Let us know what you think. The hashtag to use is Beyond Markets. And you can also hit me up on my handle. That's at Kenneth Igbomo. Now, looking at Africa's development in the past decade, the global financial crisis meant African countries had to look inwards to appro for appropriate policy response. Just over a decade later, a bigger black swan event is shaking things up again with COVID-19. And Ibrahim Mayaki, the CEO of the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, joins me now as we explore Africa's uh, development trajectory in the past decade and how the continent can position uh, for the decade ahead. Thank you so much for your time, sir. And let's first start by getting your assessment of um, the Africa's uh, position in the past decade. Uh, it would be good to uh, provide a segmentation of uh, Africa's uh, trajectory in the last 60 years. Um, you had the era of a post-colonial state uh, from the 60s roughly to the end of the 70s, where the main characteristic was a replication of the uh, behavior of a colonial state uh, in sectorally or macroeconomically. Uh, and then uh, you had, uh, uh, at the end of the 70s, a, a sense of uh, uh, necessity to plan uh, our economies and to have a slightly greater ownership of uh, our planning processes, the design of our policies. And uh, then came, uh, uh, as uh, you know, in, uh, in the 70s, uh, uh, the crisis of oil prices and uh, that immense flow of resources, which had to be channeled somewhere. And many African countries uh, did uh, get into uh, debt. And that debt, uh, I'm cutting the story short, that debt led them uh, to structural adjustments because they were uh, at the end of, uh, at the beginning of the 80s and until the end of uh, of the 80s, they were in strong difficulties in order to reimburse their debt. So that structural adjustment erased uh, every capacity to think strategically and in the long term. And uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, after the structural adjustment processes, uh, we were faced globally in all the regions with uh, what was called poverty reduction strategies uh, promoted by the World Bank, the IMF, most of the uh, uh, institutional financial uh, institutions, the international financial institutions. And uh, uh, thinking about reduction of poverty didn't allow us to think about managing development. And that's why uh, at the beginning of the 2000, uh, you have uh, critical leaders like Tabo Mbeki, Olusegono Basanjo, uh, Abulai Wad, who in their interaction with the G8 and other international partners, uh, start to think about uh, what was then called the new partnership for Africa's development. And that new partnership for Africa's development was an intent and, and an ambition to own uh, development strategies uh, based on a very simple diagnosis, uh, which is the African paradox, a high density of resources and uh, extreme poverty. So uh, NEPAD in its thinking did promote ownership of development strategies. And in the 2000s, uh, that coincided with the creation of the African Union. And the African Union uh, 
did put the emphasis on regional integration processes, because evidently leaders realized that if Africa uh, didn't put its forces together, it wouldn't count at all on the global scene. And the regional integration was the motto of uh, the African Union. With that paradigm shift from political liberation, which was the motto of the OAU, to uh, development-focused strategies based on regional integration, which was the motto of the African Union. And NEPAD was fully coherent with that process. So from the years 2000 uh, until uh, the years 2015, as you know, Africa doubled the sizes of its economy and uh, uh, with quite good uh, economy growth rates. But the main limit of that growth trajectory was the fact that it wasn't inclusive enough. What does inclusiveness mean in very pragmatic, concrete terms? It means reduction of inequality and it means creation of jobs. So we didn't industrialize enough. Well, our ratio of manufacture to GDP was too slow. And uh, we were not innovative enough, even if we grew, we are not innovative enough to tackle this huge challenge that we have which is uh, uh, derived from our demographic composition. 75% of Africans are under 25. So that gives you cohorts of young coming on the employment market, which are uh, in uh, huge and massive numbers. So the growth trajectory did prove uh, significant. Macroeconomic issues were quite well tackled. Uh, public finance management was quite well tackled, but that growth was not inclusive enough. And these are the issues that in, we need to face today. So uh, with a pandemic, uh, three things happen, are happening. Uh, the first one is that we are, and uh, uh, as a consequence of the lockdowns, different forms of lockdowns, uh, we, our fiscal capacity has been reduced uh, and our uh, uh, obligations to reimburse the debt has a direct impact on our public finances. On the second hand, uh, we were not already very good at uh, uh, having uh, uh, optimal fiscal pressure. We are the region of the world where the fiscal pressure is the lowest. And thirdly, as a consequence of a pandemic, uh, critical indicators like unemployment and poverty have, have worsened. So now we are at a juncture. I don't think Africa has a liquidity issue. You know, if you look at uh, the uh, illicit financial flows, and I'm co-chairing a, a high-level UN panel on illicit financial flows, you see that we lose hundreds of billions of dollars uh, uh, through uh, uh, tax evasion, tax avoidance, corruption, money laundering. And if you look at our pension funds, our sovereign wealth funds, and you estimate their assets under management, is it is over $1 trillion. So the question, is how do we put our house in order? And the best way to put our house in order is to have sound institutions, sound leadership, and organized societies. Very good We're talking about putting our house in order. And I thank you. Very interesting breakdown you did there, talking about the key themes that have shaped Africa's development in the past decade, talk, starting from the African paradox, which you mentioned, to, to inclusiveness and to development challenges that were seen on the continent today. And even finally, like you mentioned, illicit flows. But now, like you mentioned, we're in a pandemic and we're seeing this pandemic reset our development trajectory. And for you, I would like you to speak to the importance of not letting um, a, a, a crisis go to waste and how we can build back better. You see, uh, in um, the Chinese uh, ideogram, character, 
uh, for crisis uh, means at the same time uh, danger and opportunity. So we are at a crossroad. And uh, three key uh, uh, factors will uh, provide a positive change or a negative change. In, but in any case, change will happen. So what are these three factors? The first factor is the reform of the states that we have. Uh, we need developmental states. And developmental states uh, need to have a specific behavior. And that behavior uh, is based on a combination of bottom-up processes and top-down processes. Leadership is not about leaders sitting in capitals giving instruction. Leaders need to put their hands uh, in the nitty-gritty of implementation. And uh, that has to do with a reform of the state. The second issue is uh, how do we reprioritize uh, our uh, uh, strategic agenda? And reprioritizing our strategic, strategic agenda needs to focus on human capital, innovation, science, and technology. Because with uh, a human capital development, science and technology and innovation will open the ways for really a transformation of our of our economies and it will allow industrialization to happen. And the, the third the third point is about trade. The third point is about trade. It will be important. Uh, it will be important to implement the African continental free trade area. All right, I need you to take a quick break now and then definitely hold that thought. And when we return, we'll continue to get your thoughts on what, how you think trade can impact Africa's development trajectory. Welcome back to Beyond Market. If you're just joining us, my guest today is Ibrahim Mayaki. He's the CEO of the, the African Union's Development Agency, NEPAD. And we've been talking about uh, exploring the past decade in Africa's development story and also trying to profess some solutions on how the next decade will be. If you're just joining us earlier on the show, he, was, he talked about very interesting things, talking about the African paradox, inclusiveness. He also mentioned the fact that we need state reforms and he also raised the leadership question. But now we're getting into the area of trade. And I'd like, uh, and I, Sarah, I would like you to share uh, how you think the AFCFTA could be that game changer for the continent when you look at how we develop um, in the next decade? Uh, the AFCFTA needs an ecosystem which can allow it to be implemented efficiently. If that ecosystem doesn't exist, the AFCFTA cannot be implemented. So what do I mean by the ecosystem of the CFTA. First of all, I mean, human capital development. Uh, that will be absolutely critical, uh, skills. Secondly, uh, I mean, industrialization. Our uh, ratio of uh, manufacture uh, to GDP has to increase significantly. And thirdly, uh, infrastructure infrastructure, whether it is roads, energy, uh, rails, digital transformation. These three factors cons do constitute the ecosystem of the CFTA. Otherwise, the CFTA just by itself wouldn't be implementable. And in order to build that ecosystem, you need regional policies. 
national policies are not optimal enough in order to allow uh, the strengthening of these three factors. Human capital, as technology and innovation, uh, industrialization and infrastructure. That's the first point. The second point is that all African policymakers will have to face in the next 20 years massive challenges. One of the massive challenges is how to create 20 million jobs per year in the next 20 years. This is 400 million youth. And be mindful of the fact that these 400 million are already born and do coexist with us. So you cannot have a, a small solution to a massive problem. So the, the solutions need to be at the level of the massive numbers that we are facing. And these solutions need to have two characteristics. The first one, regional strategies, because national strategies will not work. And secondly, boosting our intra-Africa trade, which will mean a change of mindset at the level of our leaders. Uh, it is true that uh, many leaders do and sign and ratify, but signing and ratifying is not enough. You need to show practically how you open your borders, how you cooperate with your neighbors, how you make sure that you think in terms of a general interest, which is not an addition of particular or individual or national interests. All right, but when you look at how things are playing, because I like the breakdown you put, they're talking about the ecosystem needed to drive trade, the, the need for regional policies to drive the AFCFTA, and also the policymakers and the headache they have with creating jobs, and like you rightly mentioned lastly, the mindset change that we need in leadership. But I'd like to get into the very nature of how the African, African um, economy is or is structured especially looking at how we have a large informal sector and how we can capture that more in more formal terms or work around how we can get it there so that we can use that to drive industrialization and, and produce at scale, at scale. Because part of the challenge that we have is that we're still seeing a lot of subsistence um, production across board and we're not going to meet, if, if we are to create the 20 million jobs like you rightly mentioned, we need to turn that informal sector into uh, uh, and scale up and scale it up drastically. I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Absolutely. 20 million jobs per year. Eh? Uh, but this is a very important question. Uh, uh, my first point is that you have several Africas. Uh, Southern Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, West Africa, and North Africa. Uh, North Africa is the least integrated region uh, with uh, uh, quite individualistic strategies. Uh, Central Africa is also the second least integrated region. Uh, East Africa is the most integrated region because uh, uh, the leaders in East Africa have taken in charge uh, an interaction which is based on economic development. Uh, they meet regularly, uh, they review their strategies they get feedbacks and they correct. Uh, so they, we can think that they have a, a regional market. Uh, Southern Africa as a locomotive, which is South Africa, and most of the other countries uh, do uh, 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 um, have these strong linkages with, uh, with South Africa. And then you have West Africa. And West Africa uh, as Nigeria. Nigeria is the main locomotive of, of West Africa. When Nigeria goes well, the rest of West Africa goes well. If Nigeria doesn't go well, the rest of West Africa cannot go well. So you have different Africas with different challenges. Now the point that you are mentioning is a, a systemic point in the continent. Uh, the informal economy is, can roughly be estimated at beyond 60% of our economies. Uh, as, a, as a mean, uh, and uh, 
most of the job, more than 80% of the jobs do exist in that informal economy. And that informal economy is composed of micro, small, and medium enterprises. The pity is that uh, we have banks with liquidity. And uh, uh, that liquidity doesn't reach the micro, small, and medium enterprises under the pretext that they are informal. So it is the role of the state to accompany the micro, small, and medium enterprises, link them with the financial sectors so that they can be funded and induce an economic transformation. As long as that doesn't happen, we will not be able to create these 20 million jobs per year I was referring to. All right, then. Now let's look at now, look to be more forward looking and look at the decade after. In 10 years now, we're going to be talking about the, meeting the targets for the sustainable development goals. And when you look at all the metrics involved, you know, when you look at all the, the goals and the targets set by the United Nations, still quite a lot when you look at what Africa needs to do. But as we prepare for that decade after and the challenges that we're seeing that, was, that we need to address to get to the point where we can say we have, we have ticked the boxes on, on some of the, the, the development targets, I'd like you to talk to how you think we should reform as a continent. Yes, I, I will answer your question, uh, but I, I will have the humility to say that uh, predictions are very uh, uh, difficult to make, uh, and I don't like to predict. But on the basis of the current conditions of the different regions of the continent, I, I see East Africa progressing quite well. Uh, I see uh, Southern Africa, when uh, if they go through the reforms of the states that they have, through South Africa, uh, Angola, uh, Mozambique, Namibia, etc., they can fix their economic issues and create the jobs I was referring to. Uh, Central Africa is uh, the black hole of a continent. Central Africa will have to reform massively uh, and uh, uh, find ways to better integrate their economies. This is essential. And West Africa will depend fundamentally on uh, uh, the trajectory that Nigeria will take. Nigeria has taken, uh, uh, let's say, a much better trajectory than it had in the past. So now the question in West Africa is how do we solve the security issues in the Sahel, because you know the security issue has a huge impact on the Sahel, uh, from Mauritania uh, to Chad, and uh, it creates a very important uh, uh, challenge uh, to the governments of the region. But let me mention one fact: Why do we have Boko Haram? Why do we have a jihadist? For the simple reason that central governments neglected economically and socially the regions where these groups started to develop. So now we have to catch up. Uh, and in North Africa, uh, uh, Libya has to be solved so that we have a, a certain form of stability. So if we try to look at the trends, uh, uh, two conditions will be essential for a positive trend uh, to be to be developed. The first condition, and, and I, insist, I, ins I insist again, is institutional quality. Uh, you need a state with high-level civil, civil servants. You need an independent judiciary. You need rules and norms to be applied. You need strong regulatory mechanisms so that you can attract investments within the continent and outside of the continent. So this is what I call putting its house in order. Uh, and the, the second factor is that, be mindful of the fact that in the next 10 years, uh, 90 to 95% of the uh, currently sitting heads of states will no longer be in the seats. The, a new generation will emerge. 
So what will this new generation be about? What type of new leadership will we have? This is the essential question. Will this new leadership uh, uh, embrace institutional development, the necessary reforms, and uh, uh, put its hand in the nitty gritty of implementation? Or will this new leadership uh, just uh, continue to surf on the old waves? This is the big question. So uh, Africa's trajectory will depend on the quality of the leadership that will emerge in the next 10 years. And 90 to 95% of the current heads of states will no longer be here. So I encourage all the youth, all the uh, uh, political parties, all the private sector, all the civil society organization to be mindful of that fact and prepare the conditions that can allow the emergence of a sound leadership. Definitely leadership playing a very critical role in how the continent is going to play. A strong words there from Ibrahim Mayaki. But now I want to get into one area that I also think is pertinent. And when you look at migration and the brain drain that we're seeing on the continent, you mentioned human capacity development earlier and the importance it has. But how do we enlighten the future generation and even the young Africans about the opportunities in Africa and how we can come together and develop this continent and come up with our own solutions to our challenges? First of all, migration, uh, fundamentally, if you look at the numbers, is internal to the continent. 80% of uh, Africans who migrate, migrate inside the continent. Uh, they do not migrate outside. So uh, it, it is important to mention it because we always think about, you know, migrants crossing the Mediterranean, et cetera, and going to Europe. But the majority of migration is an internal African migration. And that internal African migration has to be stimulated. And I hope the African continental free trade area will help stimulate that migration so that you can have an allocation of human capital according to the needs in the different regions of, of, uh, of a continent. That's, that's a, a key point. Uh, the, the second point about the, the, the need is skills. You see, uh, during the structural adjustment uh, uh, processes and programs in 80s and 90s, we totally neglected uh, the uh, technical vocational training centers. So now, uh, as the African Union Development Agency, this is one of our priorities, how we revitalize all this dimension of technical vocational training, but not just to uh, create and train for skills which do not have any link with the economy. So we bring private sector enterprises to reflect with us on the curricula of the technical vocational training centers so that uh, uh, the skills that are produced do respond to the needs of uh, private sector enterprises. And this, is, this has to be massive. To a massive problem, you need massive solutions. So technical vocational training centers have to be demultiplied all over so that uh, uh, in conjunction with the needs of a private sector, they can move our economies, uh, taking into account the required skills for the transformation of these economies. And if these skilled young, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, trained uh, 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 talents can move across the continent and uh, provide their contribution to the transformation, then uh, I can say that regional integration will make uh, important moves forward. All right, and thank you so much for your time and contributions on the show today. Very interesting insight you have put forward.
on the continent looking back at how we have come to where we are and how the COVID-19 is playing a major role in how we should rethink, how we should shape that future. Thank you so much. I've been speaking to Ibrahim Mayaki. He's the CEO of the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD. And that's it on Beyond Markets for today. And thank you so much for being a part of the show. From me and the team, and remember you can watch this show at 5 p.m. West Africa time daily and have access to all episodes of Beyond Markets on our website. That's at cnbcafrica.com. For me and the team, enjoy the rest of your day.